Well, very much in the same way as we could with dementia, which is to say pretty much the same way we do in every other disease. We manage symptoms, and the symptoms are pretty similar. We deal with polypharmacy. The average octogenarian in their last year of life is on 15 different medications. And most importantly of all, we look at goals of care and advanced care planning, and this is where things went awry with Agnes. Her goals of care weren't met, and no one was there to stand up for her, or Seymour, who was only making the decision that he thought was right for his mother at the time. The final case is Clancy. Now, Clancy's a bit younger than the other cases. He's 59, and he's still working as the chief of police. And one day, he's at the donut store, as a, as a policeman is wont to be, when he uh, clutches his chest and falls to the ground and suffers a cardiac arrest. And his uh, colleagues, well-trained police officers, commence CPR, and an ambulance arrives. And the ambulance places him onto a mechanical CPR device. Now this is the Lucas II, which is the device that we use here in Sydney. It's affectionately known as the Thumper, and uh, somewhat less affectionately known as the Granny Smasher. Um, now, this, if I was to show you this image in black and white, you would think I'm showing you a scene from Game of Thrones. Then this looks like some sort of medieval torture device. Now, the why do we use this device? Well, let me tell you that as a paramedic, when I was a paramedic, you'd go to a cardiac arrest, you'd drive there like the clappers, and you'd get there, and if it was a, if it was a, I worked in Auckland where, where there was an abundance of common sense, which unfortunately is lacking here in Sydney, I'm sad to say. Um, if the patient was clearly in their 90s or clearly suffering from a chronic disease, and it was an unwitnessed cardiac arrest, and the patient was in asystole, we'd do nothing which is absolutely the right thing to do. If it was someone a bit younger and they were in VF or it was a witnessed collapse or there was already a bystander doing CPR, we'd do CPR. And we'd intubate them and we'd give some adrenaline, some amiodarone and give some shocks. We'd do everything that would be done in the hospital. So there was no value in taking the patient to hospital. So after 30 minutes, we'd terminate resuscitation in the field and the police would come and the undertaker would come and we'd arrange counselling and we'd sit down and we'd talk to the family and we'd make them a cup of tea and we'd be on scene for two or three hours. That's the way it should be done. But things are changing. There's new technology available. Intensive care is moving into the age of ECMO. ECMO is mechanical cardiovascular support. It's a heart lung machine. And ambulances in Sydney now are applying this device to patients in cardiac arrest and transporting them to RPA or St Vincent's Hospital to go on to ECMO. Now, don't get me wrong. I think this is potentially a very good thing. Um, the, we're part of a clinical trial and the initial phase of the clinical trial was conducted at the Alfred in Melbourne last year. So what they did was um, they, the ambulance service in Victoria had a very similar protocol to what we had in Auckland. So at the end of 30 minutes you terminate resuscitation. If um, at the end of 30 minutes in this study, if the patient was under 65 and the cardiac arrest was of a presumed cardiac origin or a PE, and the patient had no evidence of any metastatic disease or any other condition which would preclude a return to normal function. Instead of terminating CPR, the paramedics would apply the Lucas II device, transport the patient to the Alfred, and they'd go on to ECMO. About 60 patients. These were all patients who were going to die. The paramedics were going to, resusc were going to terminate resuscitation in the field. All those 60 patients, half of them walked out of hospital neurologically intact. So this is technology which is going to change the way we practice intensive care and it's going to change the practice of resuscitation and it's very exciting. But it's also quite scary. And I think for guidance, we have to look back to the man who started it all. And on the, um, I'm not very good with left and right, um, on the far side of that picture there, it's a good job I'm not off the point. Um, that's Peter Saffer, the father of intensive care. This is him developing CPR as a treatment. The man on the ground is one of his residents who's been anaesthetised to be practised on. Things were different in the 1960s. <laughs> um, and he had a very clear view on this, on, on, on how CPR should be conducted. And this is a slide which I've borrowed from Twitter from a, from a conference that happened in New York earlier in the year. This was a talk given by Ashley Shreves, who's a dual trained emergency physician and palliative care specialist, which is actually a very common combination in the United States. 
These are, this is from the original paper on CPR in JAMA in 1961, and I'll read you the indications and contraindications for resuscitation. Not all dying patients should have cardiopulmonary resuscitation attempted. Some evaluation should be made before proceeding. The cardiac arrest should be sudden and unexpected. The patient should not be in the terminal stages of a malignant disease or other chronic disease, and there should be some possibility of a return to functional existence. Common sense from the man who started it all. Look at what we do now. We routinely attempt to resuscitate people who are dying of a chronic disease. And the worry is that this amazing new ECMO technology will, will follow the way of CPR and will be using it on everyone. And intensive care units will become warehouses for the dying, filled with 90-year-olds and terminal cancer patients on ECMO. And this is something that we need to stand up and say, no, this is a technology that should be saving young lives and saving lives of people who are going to go back and live a normal life. This is not a new pathway to dying. So, I've told you some bad stuff. What about the good stuff in the future? I want to make two comparisons to intensive care to show you that I think palliative care is on a strong footing for the future. This is the SAFE study published in 2004, a, a 7,000 patient multi-centre randomised controlled trial of saline versus albumin for resuscitation. And you might think, well, what on earth does this have to do with palliative care? Before this study was published, research in intensive care was, was fragmented, it was underpowered, it was single centre, it was led by enthusiasts with an agenda, and the reason it was done that was because people were saying you can't do good research in intensive care because you can't get consent, people are distressed, all the patients die, people won't want to work together. Sound familiar? Yeah. The ANZICS clinical trial group in Australia and New Zealand now leads the world in intensive care research, and, and every year they're churning out papers that are changing the practice of intensive care medicine. And I, I'm glad to say that palliative care in Australia is not far behind. The advent of large multi-centre trials with patient-oriented outcomes that matter um, is, is, is arriving, and, and palliative care is, is finding its way onto the pages of the New England Journal with large, well-powered studies. A matter closer to my own heart is the use of the internet and social media. And in critical care, in ICU and emergency medicine, we had this term phoned, which was coined by a couple of emergency physicians in Perth a few years ago. It stands for Free Open Access Medical Education. And they run this website called Life in the Fast Lane, which is the biggest critical care website in the world. Um, and it's all free. And there's, 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 there's information on here which would put any textbook to shame. And there's dozens, if not hundreds, of similar websites in the critical care world. You could go through an entire critical care training program now as a doctor or a nurse and not have to buy a single textbook because it's all freely available online. And again, I'm really pleased to say that, intensity, that palliative care is not far behind. I think it's because palliative care is also a young specialty, like intensive care. People are taking to the internet with great gusto. And there's a huge amount of information out there. And not just on web pages, but on Twitter. And there's a huge number of palliative care people on Twitter, and those of you who are, who are active on Twitter should be following the HPM, Hospice and Palliative Medicine, which is the American term, hashtag. And just to give you one example of, of the, the, the great good that can be achieved here, you're probably all familiar with Kate Granger. She's a, um, a registrar in geriatrics and palliative medicine in the UK who has metastatic sarcoma. And she was admitted to hospital a couple of years ago, and during one particularly dark admission, it dawned on her that, that no one, almost no one involved in her care, from the doctors to the nurses to the cleaners, was introducing themselves. So these were people sharing the most intimate moments of her life and not even telling her their names. So she started the hashtag Hello My Name Is campaign, which has taken off to the extent that it's been adapted by the Department of Health in the UK. So it's, it's easy for one person to achieve great change on the internet. So just to recap, what have we spoken about? Well, we told the story of Abe and his pacemaker and discussed the, the rising spectre of implantable devices at the end of life, and also the major issue that, that dementia will, will, will bring forward for us coming into the future. Then we told the story of Agnes and her tabby and spoke about how the use of minimally invasive devices is a two-edged sword. It could be a, a great beacon of hope for the future, allowing us new techniques to manage symptoms, but it could also be quite a scary thing. We also spoke about ageing and frailty and how cancer is, is no longer the future of palliative medicine but frailty and dementia is. Then we spoke about Clancy and just used that as a cautionary tale 
to remind us that some great technologies are emerging which will save many thousands of lives. This, I guarantee that one person in this room one day will have their life saved by echo CPR. I don't doubt it, but we need to be very careful. And finally, we spoke about how the research and um, the internet and social media is going to play a huge part in our future. And I just want to leave you to come back to where I started by showing the similarities between intensive care and palliative care as we go forward into the future. I want to leave you with a couple of quotes. The first from 1985 from an ethicist. The success of intensive care is not, therefore, to be measured by the statistics of survival as a late death or a medical failure. It's to be measured by the quality of the lives preserved or restored and by the quality of the dying of those in whose interest it is to die and by the quality of the human relationships involved in each death. Now, this quote could easily, you could replace intensive care with palliative care and, and you wouldn't notice the difference. For 30 years now, intensive care has been trying to achieve the same goals as palliative care and, and we will continue to do so going forward into the future. And we can go back even further and have an even simpler version of this quote given by the great man Peter Saffer, which is that death is not the enemy, but occasionally needs help with the timing. And with that thought, back to the future, I'm out of time. Thank you. <laughs>